Thank you. Um, <clears throat> behind me you see a picture of my center, the John Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. So uh, NASA <coughs> consists of the NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. and 10 of its field centers. And uh, the Glenn Center sits in the Midwest of the United States, one of the, one of the oldest centers. And so I was putting together my talk, and in codex style, you need to have your question, right? So I was struggling with my question. And then I realized, well, there's the front gate. So I've been going through that for 30 years, and about five, 6,000 times. And so that's the question I've really been working on my entire career. So let's talk about that. So research and technology for the benefit of all. So how do we take all the space technology that we've been hearing about and bring it back down to the ground to increase the benefits to everyone back on Earth? So uh, it's been a wonderful three days. A lot of the discussion has been on the democratization of technology. We heard this morning about uh, democratization of energy, uh, all the way down to the electrons, transactional energy. We heard about blockchain. Uh, we even heard about eliminating democracy and creating your own uh, forms of government right the first day. So uh, a little bit about where we're going. So I thank Douglas for saving me a couple minutes and giving him back because I'm going to need all the 15 that I've got. Because um, the challenge is going to be for 30 years of, of work, how do you condense that down to 15? So I'm stressing on that a little bit. But we are going deeper into space. So we're leaving the region that we've been working in low Earth orbit. We've had, as Douglas said, operations there 24-7 for years. And we've done that very well. And to go deeper in space, though, we're going to require new technologies. We're going to require new technologies in power, in propulsion. Uh, we're going to require uh, more advanced life support and advanced communications, because we're always going to want to get that data, data back. So today I'm going to walk you through a little bit on how I think you can get better return on investment for the technologies that we've been investing in. How, and, and it really comes down to those of you CEOs and have a really short attention span. Uh, I'll tell you what that, the answer to that question is now. So the first part is to have purposeful technology transfer. So we can't just rely on chance to get our technologies used in other industries. It's great that they're used in incubators and hospitals, but you need to plan of actually transferring your advanced communication technology into the biomedical space. We really have to learn how to take the inventions from the minds of the inventors where they rely. That's where the IP really sits and get into the hands of entrepreneurs. So there's tools to do that. We really need to look at crossing technical disciplines because it's that crossing that, that, that creates innovation. We need to look at really simplifying some of our processes, simplifying licensing processes. And then furthermore, we need to, although we innovate and we manufacture locally, we need to be thinking about selling globally. So first example, so electric propulsion. We touched on that a little bit. Uh, I put this one up because it's really my first love. I worked in electric propulsion uh, for the first 10 years of my career. In the corner there, you see the ion engine, which NASA invented in Cleveland, Ohio in the late 1950s. We first flew it in 1964, and we've now used it on planetary missions, most recently on the Dawn spacecraft that visited Vesta in series. And, and we're planning on using more advanced propulsion. The other picture you have there is the uh, hull thruster. And my, uh, my, my compliments to the, to the scientists in Russia who really advanced a lot of that technology. Um, both those, both those technologies are the stuff of science fiction. We're taking xenon, xenon, we're converting it into a plasma, the fourth state of matter, and then we're accelerating it out of thousands of meters a second to get the thrust. But what's little known about that, because you see those pictures in all the space movies, is really the impact that that technology has had on the commercial industrial base. All commercial ion sources rely on that technology for materials processing. And it's revolutionized areas such as semiconductors, biomedical field, and even optical coatings. And so you, you wonder why I've got this picture of this pilot here with these sunglasses. So these sunglasses here are one of those spin-offs. Uh, it turns out that in 1975, the spin-offs happened because there was a purposeful decision made. Resources were provided to the technologists to look at investments in other industries, both their time and some of their talents. And at that time, three researchers that I worked with at the tail end of their career they had injected a hydrocarbon gas into the ion engine and, interesting enough, created carbon ions and when they hit the surface formed a nice diamond-like film that was then licensed to a sunglass manufacturer that commercialized the technology with 10 times the hardness and also increased the, the cleanliness of the lenses. So from propulsion, you need power. And NASA's been working on power systems since its inception. 
on the corner there you see the, the rovers. Those are powered by nuclear power sources. Those nuclear power sources are powered by a nuclear isotope that's fairly rare. It's in precious supply, so we, as we've seen with all energy resources, we want to use them as efficient, if efficiently as possible. And so the conversion from heat to electricity is of great concern to us. We look to do that as efficient as possible. Some of our researchers have invented a thermoacoustic Stirling power cycle. That technology is quickly snapped up and is finding its way into residential power systems. So now we talk about microgrids, the transactional energy. These little microgrids powered by this technology can provide up to four kilowatts of electricity, also providing thermal power. And that didn't just happen, right? That technology sits in, a, in, in somebody's head. And too often we sit there and we try and transfer technology simply by licensing a patent. And NASA has 1,500 patents that we were in, in the process of, of licensing. But really what we've seen is it's not just when that license gets signed and all of a sudden miraculously the technology gets transferred. It's really inside the, uh, the inventor's heads and working, finding ways to work with those government inventors. We've been engaging in novel partnership agreements that allow times up to eight hours all the way down to several months. For those, those two groups, the entrepreneurs and the inventors, to work collaboratively to actually transfer that technology. That's really been the secret to that success. Space communications. So it's an honor to be in this building, right? BT headquarters. This is the site where in 1897, Marconi sent the first public wireless signals. Getting a little bit closer, 1993, September 12, 1993, was another momentous event. It was the launch of the Advanced Communications Technology Satellite, ACTS. ACTS was the first digital switchboard in the sky. It enabled high-speed voice, data, and video to be transmitted. It opened up the KA spectrum from 18 to 30 gigahertz. It allows what we're doing today to really be done without us thinking about it. But a lesser known fact is ACTS input or ACTS impact across disciplines. ACTS was a pioneer in telemedicine. So it was really the first time that physicians at the Mayo Clinic demonstrated the ability to provide the same quality of care you'd have in, a, in an urban setting into a rural setting. And at that time, they diagnosed uh, a previously misdiagnosed skin condition as leprosy, and a young child got to be healed. That same working across disciplines can actually be seeded. And so we provided a little bit of resources to look at what the, some of the technologies that my group's been doing in RF communications, and could that technology somehow find its way in the biomedical space? And so two physicists took up the challenge. They typically work on antennas. They don't work in the biomedical arena at all. They invented a biomem sensor, size of a pinhead, half a millimeter by a millimeter, made of gold and silicone. Embedded in there was a loop antenna. It measured blood pressure and heart rate, and because it did it wirelessly, and if you've been to a hospital, you see all the wires that everybody hooks you up for an EKG and you can't get any rest. It was able to be put on the head of a catheter, and that was quickly licensed by a medical company that was able to get $40 million of capital, private capital, to take that to market and clinical application. So materials, underlying, every, underlying everything are, are materials for extreme environments. Douglas mentioned how where we work is a very extreme environment. One of the applications that we look at, and the folks at Rolls-Royce uh, on, on the first day uh, did an excellent talk, inside a jet engine is a very harsh environment. We do a lot of propulsion work at NASA. So taking measurements inside a jet engine to extend that life to understand what's going on, we developed silicon carbide electronics. They're able to survive at 500 degrees Celsius. Thought this is a fantastic invention. Who wouldn't want to use this? But interesting enough, People weren't knocking down our doors to license the technology. So we started looking into a little bit why that happens. So I mentioned NASA has 500 or 1,500 patents. Um, and with all those patents, my center alone has about 100 disclosures, about 20 more we add each year. Interesting enough, for our 76 years of, of the existence of our center, for about 73, we would license about zero to one. That's a pretty bad return on investment by any measure. We tried to turn that around a few years ago to see how we did that. And so we were very successful. Last year we licensed over 51 inventions to 23 different companies, the most we've ever done in the agency. And we attributed a few things. We started using some of the tools that are available to us. The US government, one well, of the largest bureaucracies in the world, it's no surprise that some companies, big and even the small ones, find us unapproachable. So we put a face to each one of those technologies. 
So there's a person you can, you can get to, and each technology has a, a cut sheet, so you can at least uh, understand it in, in plain English. Then we looked at the fact that we do commercial licenses, we do exclusive licenses, but that's a pretty onerous process. And sometimes the technology is not ready to, to be licensed at that point. So we looked at some of the other tools. We're now offering evaluation licenses that for $2,500, you can try before you buy, you can play with the technology for a year, you can decide whether you want a commercial license, you can create new IP. But if you're getting ready to sell in the commercial market, we need to talk a little bit further. We've also introduced a startup license to encourage new companies to be formed. And it allows, us, allows them to take the IP, carve out a commercial space, and still conserve their cash for a few years. Use of those tools has allowed us now to license some of the silicon carbide technology. We've licensed to a formerly fabulous semiconductor company, a small business that now is looking at it for deep well oil exploration, as we talked the energy market earlier, looking for geothermal applications. And then this next one, so air breathing propulsion. So everyone's talking about space. I got to come back a little bit because the heritage of my center was aeronautics. And the first A in NASA still stands for aeronautics. And so I work with a lot of folks that are brilliant, been working aeronautics for their entire careers, some for 50 years. This so one brilliant researcher has been working in hypersonic flight, roughly five to 10 times the speed of the plane that took me over here to London. And the key there is it takes a lot of energy, so efficiency is very important. And he was looking at using um, non-equilibrium plasmas injected into the hydrocarbon fuel, thinking that that would increase the efficiency. And so, as any good researcher, he builds up, he has his idea, he builds up an experimental rig in one of our 100 buildings in the basement. Although at NASA we're very safety conscious, it's one of our core values. So we have a safety committee that wanted to take a look at what he was going to do before he turned it on. And then they scratched their head when they found out that you want to take extremely high electrical pulses in nanosecond time periods and inject it into jet fuel. So at that point they said, uh, absolutely not. So. We like innovation, but we also like you to be a little safe. So tongue in cheek, they said to him, why don't you try it on water first? So he actually did. So the team tried it on water, and what they found was fantastic. Those nanosecond pulses generated plasmas that completely eliminated any organic contaminants, contaminants turning it to carbon dioxide and water. They took it a little bit farther. They tried on textile dyes, which for those of you who know about water cleanliness, those are intractable contaminants. Within 15 minutes, it completely eliminated them. So again, another fantastic technology. Our tech transfer folks started looking at it, and frankly to us, that's a little bit hard to transfer, because where do I live? I live outside the Great Lakes, the world's largest collection of fresh water, 20% of all the world's fresh water. So water scarcity is not really a problem for me. I turn on the tap, water, pure fresh water comes out. In order to be able to license that technology, we needed to look up, and look up pretty high. So we engaged local industry. Local industry, uh, the, we're in the industrial Midwest. No problem making it. They licensed the technology. But the market they saw was a global market. So they were looking at innovating locally and selling globally. So to wrap it up, so what do I see the future? So I showed the picture of uh, the future of deep space exploration. And, I, and this one's, I, I hope you, you see it as a little bit richer. So this future that I envision for deep space exploration is really going to need several things. One, I believe to sustain deep space exploration, as, as our, our, our previous uh, panelists have, have said, is going to rely on the use of in-situ resources. Right? We're not going to be able to take everything we need on a major camping mission all the way out. Right? We're going to need to resupply. We're going to need to use the resources that are out there. So that means we're going to have to first find them, we're going to have to then extract them, and then we're going to have to process them. So we're going to need key technologies to make that happen. And so I put up there a few of those key technologies that we're going to make happen. But in doing that, I think that it's time for a new model. So we're already partnering with industry. We don't want to, NASA does not want to do this alone. So we're already partnering with industry to do that. But the new model I like to think about is a terrestrial tech transfer model at the beginning of our exploration technology development model. So developing technologies in parallel that have both a use for deep space exploration and are able to open up a larger market terrestrially. So you can think of autonomous excavation equipment. Things move, information moves at the speed of light, but we're talking huge distances. So that delay we can't tolerate. 
So those robotic excavation devices will need to operate autonomously. That same technology can be used here on Earth. You take a look at the processing technologies. We're going to need efficient processes that, that process the, the ore. That same technology is needed here. Same thing with the smart grids. We talked about that a lot. Our power system is going to need to operate completely autonomously. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a quote from my center's namesake, an American hero, an astronaut, John Glenn. We're not up there in space just a joy ride. We're up there to do things that are of value to everyone right here on Earth. Thank you.